Hey, welcome, Talent Warriors, to another episode of the Talent War Podcast. And following up last week, I had two amazing senior executive leaders on. And now we're about to do the third. And so stand by to get some great information on being a great leader. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have somebody who, I guess I could say you're a friend now. You're a colleague, you're a friend, because you rib me all the time when you come into the office. But (laughs) folks, I have the distinct privilege. It's really weird in your professional career when you're a skinny kid named George and you grow up to be a recruiter, you spend time in the Army. You just never know where life's going to take you. And in this particular case, I had the great fortune to run across... This crazy lady named Lisa Jaster, who from the very beginning has made sure that I stay humble at all times and challenges me when I need to. But last week we had these great leaders on. And one of the big things is that there are always challenges. And Lisa's done this thing called Delete the Adjective. And I know Lisa, a book's coming out. I know that. We're going to talk about that. When I heard the phrase that Lisa was using called Delete the Adjective... I absolutely loved it. So I want to get into that today. But with that, I think it's Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Jaster. And so how in the hell did you decide, you know what, I'm going to go be a soldier. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give this West Point thing a shot. And then, oh, yeah, there's this little thing called Ranger School. And that sounds like a fun vacation. But give us the synopsis of how this enters into your brain and how you got to be the at least the foundation of the leader you are today. So my story is like everyone's. It's very weird and unique. I was living in a really small town, Plymouth, Wisconsin, and my father was a 1968 West Point grad. So I had exposure, but I lived with my mom. My mom raised me and my paternal grandmother bought a book for 99 cents when I was in seventh grade, younger than my son is right now and sent it to me. And it's called In the Men's House by Carol Barkalow. And it's about the first class of women to go to West Point. And being a big personality in a small town, you always feel like you have to escape. And I think everybody from a small town feels like they have to escape at some point in time. But this book landed in my lap simultaneously with this feeling of I'm too much for Plymouth. You may be too much for Texas at times, Lisa. I'm sorry. (laughs) And by the way, if they didn't warn you, I'm going to take my shots. So perfect. Uh, (laughs) Perfect. Game on, George. All right. So I read this book and it sounds really hard. And at this point in time, I've done hard things, but nothing really hard. Nothing that made me think I want to quit. Nothing that made me cry when I went to bed at night. Nothing that really brought that emotion that comes only with pushing yourself to the limits. So I read this book. I'm like, that's it. I'm going to West Point. And when I was in seventh grade, that was 1990, 1991. So we already kind of started experiencing all the stuff going on in the Middle East. The military was in the forefront of the news. It was in a positive light. America was very united. I'm small town, Wisconsin, flag waving, lots of parades. The VFW is downtown kind of thing. Everything lined up. But back then you couldn't Google it. So I had to do research and I had to do real research. And my mom drove me to the local mall where I met this enlisted recruiter. And he was like, hey, I have no idea how to get you into West Point. (laughs) And so going to the library and student guidance counselors couldn't help you. Again, no Google, right? So it ended up being a big project for me to try to even find out how to get into West Point, even with an alumnus father. So the process was almost as exciting for me as the concept of going. And so it built in my mind. And then by my junior year of high school, I got to visit West Point and I walked on the campus. And one of the first things you see is a statue of Douglas MacArthur. And you start walking around and West Pointers say that most of the history we study is written about those who attended our school. And that's pretty impactful for a high school student. So I had this in my head. I was going to do a lifetime of service. 
doesn't mean I was going to wear a uniform until I died, but it meant that service to something higher mattered. And it all started with that little nugget of reading a book. So George, you and I have talked about it. We've talked about it in the talent war group, how readership is part of leadership. And it all starts with that book I read in seventh grade because it literally changed my life. And so you get this concept from me when I go to West Point for the first time, not even accepted into the school where, okay, I'm home, this fits. And to answer in a very short way, your bigger question is how did I end up at Ranger School? Well, before you get to that, I've got this crazy little fact. I can't believe I haven't shared this with you, but this is so serendipitous. So you read this book about the first women in West Point. Yes. My branch assignments officer was the third woman at West Point. Oh, wow. And then you go to your first, I did three years in Berlin. And then I came back to what was then called the officer advanced course. And I came back and then you have to go down with your dream sheet. And I walk in and there she is again. And so I go on and I go to Fort Hood and they don't have a job for me. It was weird. You know, sometimes you get stuck in a really, really weird spot and you get these orders. You're like, this makes no sense. Yes. And so they assigned me to the brigade plan shop as a first lieutenant promotable. And who is my boss? Below zone, select D, my branch manager, the third woman to graduate from West Point. And she was, I don't think I knew it, but I think that's what resonates with me with the delete the adjective. And I'm not going to get us down too far down the path. She was just an awesome freaking leader. She was actually like Colin Powell's speechwriter for a period of time. Oh, wow. And I'm just sitting there going, holy shit, I better have my act together because this person's a rock star. I just wanted to share that with you. I'm sorry I interrupted our flow, but yeah, she was amazing. Absolutely amazing leader in all aspects. It just sucked. It just sucked because I'm working with her and I'm like, you're going to give me 25, 30 years. I am not going to hit this level. It's just too good. She's just awesome. So yeah. anyway, so let's go on to Ranger School. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, I want a tangent. You were <laughs> Sorry. taking me there. I know, it's squirrel brains. It happens oh, from time There's to time. Shiny. Okay, so Ranger School, that same mentality of I want to challenge myself has never gone away. Ranger School, typically 23-year-olds, obviously prior to myself attending and the other 18 women who walked through the gate the first day, only males. So 23 year old males, that's the typical ranger school student. It was right before my 37th birthday where this Alarac came out. That's the army's announcement process. It's a formal document that said, Hey, we're thinking about having one experimental integrated ranger school class. I was completely uninterested so much that I deleted the email and never thought about it again. And I know, you know, the military George, but some of our listeners probably don't. You have your enlisted and your officers. I'm on the officer side. The enlisted, you have your senior folks and they are your right-hand men and women as the case may be, but they have so much experience. They've stayed in the weeds their whole career where officers are more at the strategic level or the management level. And my senior enlisted guy, his name is Sergeant Major Robbie Payne. To this day, he's still a pain in my ass. Love him to <laughs> death. But he reaches out to me. He's like, you have got to go. This is perfect for you. And I am at that stage in my life where I'm working for Shell Oil Company. I'm flying on the King Air to go to my project sites. I drink coffee on the airplane. There's a land cruiser waiting for me when I get there. I drive out to the site. I come back, get back on the King Air and sleep in my nice warm bed. You didn't mean coffee, Lisa. I think you meant you had a latte on the King Air, just so we're you know, perfectly some of clear. Us, if you could see, I am drinking black coffee as usual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing proofy here. So that was my life at the time. And I told him, I said, Sergeant Major, that's great, but I like room service. Like I'm not sleeping out in the mud for nine weeks. It's just not where I am anymore. And he wasn't getting anywhere talking to me. So he actually called my husband. And in the reserve, it's a lot different than active duty. There's less of a segregation. And especially the type of unit I was in, everybody was really, really close because it was a small unit. And so Sergeant Major Payne talked to my husband and my husband decided during dinner, he was going to ask me in his way, 
kind of about that little seventh grade girl, like that girl who read a book and was willing to charge the world and just make changes and do something really hard. And at that time, on my work email signature block, I had an Einstein quote that says, a ship is safest at the shore, but that's not what it's built for. And so my husband literally at the dinner table with our young children asked me about that quote and very simply said, you were built for this baby. And all that excitement that Carol's book started in that seventh grade girl was stirred up again. And it leads into the discussion we're probably going to have with regards to delete the adjective, but this is an opportunity of the lifetime. And do I sit on my laurels and watch other people do it? Or do I sit there and say, hey, I've got to try because if I try and fail, as one of my favorite quotes, Teddy Roosevelt, at least I will never end up with those poor and timid souls who neither failed nor succeeded. Like, at least I tried. And that's kind of what started it and got me to ranger school. Wow. The first thing I want to know, because I want to tee up is... Where did you come up with the concept for delete the adjective? I mean, you have all these things that drove you to West Point that drove you to have a successful career as an officer active. And we're going to talk about Shell Oil and the leadership stuff. But when did it kind of dawn in, on you that I need to be talking about this? I need to be kind of paying this forward in a way that I can impact other people like those three women that went through West Point impacted me with the book. Where did that concept come from and what sparked it for you? Obviously, it was a progression. It wasn't an overnight thing. And it was a good friend of mine at the time who made the statement, you know what? I wish people would just delete the adjective. But I met the chiefs of staff at the president's last State of the Union. I was invited to, in 2016, it was President Obama's last State of the Union. And I was invited. And all the military leadership were in a back room. And I know it's really controversial right now, but I met the most senior man in the army at the time and still, which is General Mark Milley. And for a young officer, which although 37 wasn't young, 38 isn't young, I was young in my career in comparison to these four-star generals. I said, hey, sir, it's a pleasure to meet you. What can I do? The army's given me so much because even at that short period of time, it was three months, four months after I'd graduated from ranger school. I had already been to D.C. several times. I had been able to work with the Senate Armed Services Committee. I came in and sat in on a couple meetings. I could already feel that I had a voice that I would have never had if the Army hadn't allowed me to attempt Ranger School. So I'm standing in front of General Milley. What can I do for the military? He gives me a bunch of stuff that there was no way I was going to do. Hey, come active duty. You'll be a battalion commander soon. Take an infantry battalion. And I just kept looking at him going, hell no, sir. And I'm a reservist with this great job at Shell with the room service. And so he's saying, go infantry. Hell no. Like, I know what those boys do. I'm not interested. And I'm not interested in coming active duty. I'm not. And his aide is standing behind him, like rattling his head, like one of those bobbleheads in a truck window. And he's like, nobody says no. Do you know who you're talking to? And finally, I said, sir, what can I really do? I'm going to stay a reservist. I love my job. I love being with my family. What do you really need from me? And he said, be vocal. Wow. Be vocal. Just be visible because there's people like me. And then there's a lot of people out there that feel like they can't be what they can't see. So if they see something that looks like them doing something they want to do, there's a path. But without that visual aid... They just stop themselves. And I said, okay, I can do that. And literally later that same State of the Union experience, there was a newspaper article that came out. It was just a small line. Like I wasn't that important, but my husband was taking care of the kids. So he didn't come to DC with me. And I got to invite my friend Sue Fulton as my guest. So I was sitting, there's a box that the first lady has. So I was sitting with Michelle Obama And then whoever we brought as our plus one got to sit somewhere, I think it was like West Wing, and watch the State of the Union from there. And it was a big deal, apparently, that instead of bringing my husband, I brought this activist. Sue's gay, and she's 
very, very active in Sparta. And I wish I could tell you her resume. It's insane, but she does a lot for underrepresented Mm -hmm. demographics. And somebody was talking about your lesbian friend or your gay friend. And I'm like, how about just my friend? Because she's more politically active than I am. She knew when to tell me to be quiet. Hey, have a glass of wine and walk around and relax. Okay, put that glass of wine down. You're too relaxed. (laughs) She was the perfect plus one, but she was the perfect plus one because she was Sue. Not because she was my Mm -hmm. lesbian friend, Sue. And so at some point in time, she was like, I just wish people would just delete the adjective. And when she said that, I'm like, I'm writing this down. And literally from that day on, I hashtag delete the adjective. Because she's a good friend. She's a good person. She isn't a good gay friend. She isn't a good gay person. She's just a friend. So delete the adjective. And that's kind of how it really evolved. So General Milley saying, be more public, put yourself out there. And then Sue saying, hey, there's qualities you have, and they don't necessarily anchor themselves in your adjectives. Yeah. And it's great to hear that story because the last podcast I had Lisa Schreiber and Myrna Soto. I told him, really, I was poor, so I enlisted in the reserves so I could pay my way through school. And I grew up with a very, very strong mom. I mean, she's run 2,000 person, $3 billion agencies, wicked, wicked card player, nationally ranked, highly competitive. I don't play games with her. She will do whatever it takes to win. So when I went into the military and then by virtue of my branch, my branch was co-ed. And I was telling Lisa and Myrna, I said, I grew up in an environment where I didn't care. I didn't care what was under your uniform or what wasn't under your uniform or who you were dating. It was none of my business and it had no bearing. And I said, so I kind of grew up. It's not that I didn't see discrimination or people treat people of color or women or whatever their orientation was differently. It's not that I didn't see it and I would stop it, but it just never occurred in my leadership brain because I was so worried. Did I have enough of the right people? Right. And so it's weird to be able to do this podcast. And I had those two and now I have you. And to me, if everybody could sit with the three of you, you wouldn't have to do the delete the adjective. They'd go, whoo, holy shit, I better get a little bit of humility here. So I wanted to kind of jump ahead, and I wanted to share something that they said on my podcast with you. And I wanted to know about West Point, Shell, and then certainly Ranger School. And Myrna brought this up because they're both, you'd love working with them, and I'm going to do the connection after the show, by the way. But she said, you know, I always had to, if success for men was 100%, I had to be at 115. If somebody had a good idea, they would just accept it if it was a man, but I had to have this business case well thought out because it was my idea. And she goes, but I had no problem outworking people. But she goes, you know, I get to a certain level. And then she jokes. She said, well, they all ended up working for me anyway, which I thought was (laughs) awesome. Did you experience the same thing like West Point, Shell, Ranger School? First of all, one more thing. You will always outwork anybody. I know that about you. And that's just a driver for your personality. But did you feel like that there was this kind of burden on your shoulder at West Point or Ranger School or Shell to deliver the expectation on you was artificially higher? Ooh. So this is one of those really complicated questions because (laughs) I understand that that exists because there are many people out there who have relayed that same sentiment to me as a female or a minority, or again, an underrepresented demographic. It's really important that you give that extra effort. For me, oddly enough, I saw it differently. So at West Point, yes, I stuck out as a female, which means I did have to be more precise and more almost perfect in my behaviors. But I also noticed that the dude with glasses the short kid, the slightly plump guy for an academy, that they also stuck out. So I tried to look at it as, and maybe this is a coping mechanism, but anyone who sticks out from a crowd has to put the extra effort forth. And it's not necessarily to prove that they're equals. It's because they stand out. 
I am a redhead. I am five, four and a half. Damn you. I don't forget that half. <laughs> I am. I had a higher voice than everyone else in my formation. When I was working construction in Shell and going to offshore platforms, everybody talked about the fact that there was a woman out there I would create environments where I would fit in and people would start ignoring my adjectives. So if you go offshore and you're working with a bunch of oil hands, you're going to say stuff like you're going to talk about carburetors. You're going to bring magazines. You're not going to talk about world events and public affairs because they don't care about that. They care about their muscle car that they're building in their garage when they get back home. You know, you're going to find ways to connect. And I've always found that as soon as I can fit myself into the crowd in one version, I don't have to change my appearance. I don't have to wear manly clothes. I don't have to lower my voice. But as soon as I demonstrate that there's some connection with me and the people around me, that went away. I didn't feel like I had to work harder because I felt like I no longer stuck out because people were automatically deleting the adjective. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it happened in ranger school and it was the huge slap in the face. You know, the three black guys that, came, that were in my company of a hundred people, the four guys who were wearing glasses, the one guy who was six, two, and the one guy that was kind of chubby. Those guys and me got called out for every bad push-up. Nobody else who was between 5'7 and 6'1, white with a shaved head, was called out very often because they didn't stick out. They didn't draw somebody's attention to them. Wow. I love that perspective. You know, one of the things, and you know, because you're part of the Talent War Group and we had our book, and this occurred with you, and I just wanted to share this with you as a compliment, that Mike and I put one of the premises of the book is you can't see talent. And I said, with Myrna and Lisa and with you, kind of rethinking that one a little bit, because it's like you're in your presence and you see that. So I want to get into one controversial question and we could move on because it might be a simple yes, could be a simple no. When you went into the civilian sector as a project manager, a senior project manager, did you have to negotiate harder for comp? Or did you think that everything was just flat across the board that, hey, I'm good to go. I'm living and working in a fair environment. And the reason I'm asking you this is because unsolicited, Lisa and Myrna, now they're my age group. She mentioned she probably compounded, left a couple of million on the table. And I thought, holy crap, that's a really, really big deal. Did you ever have any effects of that with any civilian employer? You know, I listened to your podcast and I had that exact same reaction that she left all that on the table. I never even thought negotiating. So coming out of the army, everything is, if you have this many years in service and you're this rank, this is what you get paid. If you look across the table at somebody who's in the same demographic as you, they get paid the exact same thing. So I didn't even realize there was anything to negotiate. And so I went through a recruiting company. I think I got five or six job offers on the table at the same time. I had about a week to choose which one I wanted. And I literally chose, hey, they have good benefits. My husband's leaving the military, so he's going to need benefits too. Great pay. And it's in Texas and we want to live in Texas. Like that was it. And I never even thought about going back and having any sort of discussion. And after leaving Shell, I only had one other full-time job where I could have negotiated, but I was going for culture. So I was going to a company specifically because I wanted not the pay. I wanted the great location and I wanted the type of company that I thought I could be the most impactful in. So I didn't negotiate money, but that time I did negotiate things like days off and other perks of the job. But yeah, I never even knew it was possible. And I remember when I got to the point where it was time to start progressing that, oh my God, I'm doing work three and four pay grades up and I'm not getting paid for it and good on the bosses. Like they're getting cheap labor and I'm working my tailbone off trying to make this happen. So oddly enough, I had this discussion with my sister last night, who's looking for her very first second job. And I made sure she didn't make the same mistakes that I, and I guess Myrna did as well. Yeah. And I was coaching a client yesterday, African-American. You've been in DC. Do you know where Sidwell Friends is? Or have you heard of that? Where the president's kids go to school? Yes. That's the school she grew up, then Dartmouth. Then I won't name the second one because I don't want people to peg who this is. But another Ivy League school for a law degree. 
and we were talking through compensation and she gave me the number and we were on zoom there's no keeping a poker face none and she goes well i take it from your expression i'm a little bit undercompensated i said you could double up on where you are i said i can find you a job right now double what you're making and she was floored and so i see that a lot but it's so weird being a talent acquisition professional because if i run into somebody like you i'm like okay, I better come big or I don't come at all because the demand, the the choices for top talent, and then you tack on top of that, that's where diversity works in a woman or an underrepresented category in their favor. I just don't think they know it. And so it's been one of my things is sharing that with them. But well, I want to get on to the real good leadership stuff because I've listened to you speak and I think that there's a lot of great things that are inspiring in your story. But you said something earlier, and I may not get it right, but I kind of want to disagree because I think you're getting older like me. You don't look it, but I know you are, and I'm going to take my shot. But one of the interesting things is when the General Milley told you to be vocal about it, and you're being vocal about it and sharing that story so people can see the path. That was the statement you said, hey, now people can see it. Right. I'm interested in what you learned Because there's a lot of people who see it and will see you and see a path, but won't believe they can do it. So how do you coach? There's got to be a lot of people in your world, whether it was West Point, whether it was Shell, Range, all across your life that go, hey, Lisa, I'd like the benefit of your advice, mentor and coaching. So let's just start and we won't put them rank ordered. But if you had to say... In order to get on that path, here's one of the things that I would communicate to any young leader, and especially leaders who don't ask or don't drive for what they want. It's a hard philosophical question. You can answer it however you want. Well, I think part one is, do you really want it? And I'm going to use a very simple example. Before I did executive coaching, I've done triathlon coaching and just CrossFit coaching because physical fitness has always been a passion of mine and being in now in my forties and still being able to deadlift in the mid three hundreds is a great thing. Well, people say, well, I can't do that. Yes, you can, but do you want it? So a lot of times people talk about weight loss and weight loss is the easiest example, but it is a direct correlation to that perfect job or making the amount of money you want or having the amount of vacation days you want or having that second home in Colorado or any of those things. Like, what do you really want and why do you want it? So when you're talking about weight loss, why do you want it? Well, I want to look good in a bikini. Okay. Well, don't talk to me because you'll never do it because you want to look good in a bikini when you're wearing that bikini, but not when you're in front of the pasta bar versus the salad bar. Okay. (laughs) I want to get healthy. Okay, but what does getting healthy mean? Are you on blood pressure medication that you have to take every single morning and you want to get off that because you want to to no longer be tethered to medications? Okay, well, you think about that every single day. And so you have something to remind you and you're motivated to do that. So whether it's weight loss, so weight loss is a simple example, or I want that job that makes me jump out of bed in the morning. What in your life drives you and reminds you every single day that that's the improvement you want to make in your life? And it's more than a sticky on your mirror. It has to be something that really is a deep down internal change you want to make. And once you figure out what that is and what your reminder is, are you able to have the self-discipline to put yourself all in? So I want to get off certain medications. Well, I'm all in on this. Well, that means you go to your refrigerator and you throw out everything that you shouldn't be having. And we can get into a whole nother debate about that. (laughs) But if you want to be an executive in your business, why do you have a TV in your bedroom, your living room, in your office? Is that driving you towards your goals? So instead of having what I just said, the reminders of the success you want to reach, you have reminders of your diversions and your wasted time. Get those out of there. In our household, we do it really simple. We have one TV in the house that's actually hooked up and another TV as a backup. 
and they're in two very public rooms. They're actually in the same room, more or less. One's upstairs, one's downstairs in our great room. But on Sunday night, we put the TV away. It goes flat against the wall and you can't even see it from within the main body of the house. And on Friday night, we pull it out. And if Wednesday night, there's a state of the union address that you want to watch, you get to press record and watch it on Friday night. We do not pull that TV out away from the wall because Monday through Friday, I want a productive family. If we've got an hour, we're eating dinner together. We're going to go sit on the lawn and watch stars. We're going to shoot our bows together because for us, having a more unified family is important. TV takes away from that. So that's a different answer than you were probably expecting. But from a philosophical standpoint, you have to have good reasons for whatever your goal is. It can't be, oh, I just want to look good in a bikini. And you have to have daily reminders and be all in enough to take away those daily distractors. Were you always like this? Yes. Where do you think that came from? My mom. She used to say when we were really young, never say I could have, I should have, or I would have. And so that always sticks with me is this morning, I was telling you the power went out. I got up at 3.30 when my husband was going, he drove to Houston this morning. So he got up at 3.30 to lift before he got in the car for four hours. I got up with him. I was wide awake. The power was out in the house. I had nothing to clean. I was walking around by candlelight and I made a conscious decision. I said, hey, what could I get done right now? Or, you know, when's the last time I went to bed? But I made a conscious decision and I made it saying, okay, well, if I go back to sleep for 30 minutes and then get up at 4.30 instead of 3.30, what am I losing? Is it worth it? You know what? Damn right, it is worth it. And I literally laid in bed smiling and I smiled, but it's living consciously. And we have these stupid phones. I have three of them, three of them. And they can take up, 100% of my time. Two TVs and three phones? Yes. That's interesting. Most people have more TVs than phones. So walk me through why you have three phones. (laughs) Actually, it's funny because it is part of my efficiency. What we were already talking about is what are my goals in life? I have one phone that I use for just like these random apps. Honestly, Apple has a monopoly on a few things. So I needed an old Apple phone to do a few things. And so I have that one and I've used that for, I've got a physical fitness app on it, just little Lisa internal things. I don't call anybody. I don't do anything for it. And then I have my army phone and all my army stuff stays on that phone and only that phone because I'm a reservist and that's supposed to be a part-time job. And I need to be able to put it away or it will consume my whole life. And then I have my phone. That's the one I really use. So I even organize my life with my phones, which I know is a weird thing, but it is super useful for me because I don't spend a lot of time on silly apps because all of those apps are on one phone that I don't carry with me. Wow. I was getting out my notepad because you said something, but I want to tie it back to leadership because you're the first person who said it. And when I ask people about motivation and change, you got to really want it. And there's a lot of coaches and a lot of professionals have shared that thought with me, but nobody had shared the thought until you, maybe I'm just not talking to the right people, to get rid of diversions. So when you want to be a professional, when you want to be a leader, for me, the worst thing is I love double stuffed Oreos. And I'm pretty big on fitness. I mean, I did 90 minutes on the soccer field Sunday. I've got two games on Sunday, so I'll do back-to-back 90 games, which at my age, I should not be doing. I'm in the gym (laughs) five days a week. My alarm's off at 345, but double stuffed Oreos look great, and they taste great. Yes. So I only do that distraction once every six months. But, you know, as a leader, when we talked about the three phones and you talked about removing distractions, is there anything that helps you be a better leader, a better professional Or how would you tell somebody that the distractions in your professional life, what would you tell them to get rid of to keep you more focused as a professional, as a growing professional? Because that's one thing I know about you. You're just never satisfied. And you know, you've got to keep learning to go where you want to go. But as a professional, what things did you have to learn to give away? Or what would you tell professionals and especially moving to the executives? You got to get this distraction out of your way. Anything come to mind? I love social media. 
So I would never say get rid of it, but we have started failing ourselves as professionals. Now, if you're casual Facebook user and you do it to look at your friends, kids pictures, that's fine. But we have started unfriending or blocking people who think differently than us. And I think that's why our society is splintering so much. So if it's a professional who wants to grow part of being a professional and definitely a huge part of being a leader is to connect with those diverse populations. And again, when I talk about diversity, I don't care about your adjective. I think more of cognitive diversity because you can be white, black, green, or purple and think like President Trump or like President Biden. Yeah. That's not the diversity. The thought process is the diversity. The being a conservative or being a liberal is the diversity that we're discussing, not race, age, or gender. And we have a bad habit of closing the doors and creating these echo chambers and living in there. But as a leader, I have to be able to connect with other people. So I would say, if that's the way you're living, if you only want happy thoughts on your social media, then you definitely need to reduce your social media, but you need to broaden your horizon. Because when you said that, you were talking about getting rid of those diversions, those distractions, but you also said continue to develop as a leader. So replace that time that you're spending on those social media apps and go to something like LinkedIn and follow people who they're still professionals, but they don't necessarily line up in the same political lines or the same social lines or the so same economic lines as you do. Follow them and see because on something like LinkedIn or I also have the Harvard Business Review and The Economist downloaded on my phone. I love listening to Al Jazeera. It's just a totally different take on the things that we see only from our foxhole. And seeing what Europeans think about American politics will really help you understand and grasp and grow and then connect with a larger population. Yeah, I miss being overseas and being able to see BBC World News. I mean, I can still get it on the app and stuff like that. But the viewpoint outside of our foxhole is so different. And I know we're going to come up on time, so I want to make sure I get a couple things in. Was it Colin Powell, General Powell, that had kind of his 10 rules of leadership? I think it was. I don't know. Yeah. See, that's I'm Cold War, your global war on terror veteran. Don't There's even, the difference. Don't even, because I remember working at a gas station and doing all the research I could possibly do on Colin Powell, because for whatever reason, he was probably one of the most influential leaders when I was a high school student and I couldn't absorb enough about that man. But I don't remember if his was the 10 rules or... I think it was him, the 10 rules, but irrelevant. If you had to come up with top three, top five leadership tips that have kept you grounded, kept you growing, kept you succeeding, kept you thinking differently... What three things would you want to pass along to aspiring leaders or leaders in roles for them to get better? What would come from you after all the great things that you've done and learned? I have my three C's. So luckily for me, as a battalion commander in the reserve, I actually give these kind of talks. Otherwise, you would have stumped me on that one. <laughs> it's usually hard to come up with three points. But I do talk with my junior leaders and my company commanders about the three C's. And the first one is competency. Like you have to have a baseline of competency. Now I've worked construction for 21 plus or minus years in the military within Shell, being on the front end engineering and design side with MS engineering firm. So I've done something with construction since I was 22 years old. I don't know how to build much. I can tinker. I can build little things. I'm building a little concrete pad in the backyard. But I don't know how to do much, but I have a base level of competency in that, but I'm a project manager and I have a high level of competency in project management, which I've transitioned to IT on previous projects. I've done project management in a bunch of non-construction and financial arenas. So my core competency is project management. You have to have competency as a leader so that you can walk into the room and at least know when people are BSing you, to mm -hmm. be honest. The next thing I think is communication. We as leaders, especially as we ascend in the ranks, love to preach. We love to put our message out there. But 
the way we want to communicate is not the way people need to hear us. And so if you are a good leader, you need to tailor your message to your audience. If you have an audience that fits a certain demographic, you need to figure out a way to connect to them in such a way that they can hear you. I cannot talk to my nine-year-old daughter the same way that I talk to my 13-year-old son and get the same reaction. (laughs) So if it's that simple at home, imagine being a corporate leader when you have, I've got over 1,200 civilian and military full-time and part-time employees in my reserve battalion. And I do that one week in a month, two weeks out of the year. How I communicate is important. And I can't just blast something out to almost 1300 people and expect them to all hear the same thing. So communication is critical. And then my third point, which is actually what I think is the division between a good leader and just a good worker, because competency, competency and communication are standard across the board. But as a leader, consistency Now, if I was a teacher in college, I'd be stomping my foot and hitting the blackboard with the eraser because Consistency is key. You cannot be an emotional leader. I cannot express enough how frustrating it is to have someone that when they're in your presence, when they're face to face, they're easy to communicate. And then when they're gone and you follow what you think they'd want you to do, had they been there, they're just mad. Or if you have the leader that one day they want you to do X, Y, and Z, and then the next day they're focused on A, B, and C or they're emotional, they get mad about certain things, they don't get mad. If you're trying to figure out what your leader wants you to do, you can't follow them. You're just putting out fires. So as a leader, you need to be consistent. And sometimes when people make decisions for you because you're not available, you're in a meeting, you maybe actually take one of those vacations that we as leaders almost never take and you leave your phone in the hotel room and your employees or your junior leaders make a decision without you, and it's kind of along the right route, compliment them on the fact that they tried to do what they thought you would like. But without being a consistent leader, you can't build your followers into leaders. Yeah. I love those three C's. And so two final questions for you, and I'm not going to try to stump you. You've had an amazing career. You have even better things in front of you. But you and I both know if we, there are moments in my military career where I'm like, I'm very grateful I did not grow up in the era of social media. I'm very, very grateful. But if you were to go back and tell your 20-year-old self as you were graduating from West Point, if you could take what you've learned to date and go back to that person as they graduated What three things that you wish you had learned earlier or that would have made your career more successful, easier, or more enjoyable? What would you tell that person? I think the most important thing I would tell my younger self is get comfortable with failure and enjoy it. There are a few things that I've done in my life, again, that I would not have wanted on social media, but I'm so glad they happened. At the time, I remember praying (laughs) and wishing and hoping that I found a genie in a bottle so I could turn back time. But I succeed where I am today because I had those failures. And some of them isn't even the impact of the failure in the overall scheme of things. It's my emotional changes when I fail. And I've gotten to the point in my life where I relish my failures. I love my failures. I look forward to my failures. And I don't think at 20, you can really understand that, Mm -hmm. but finding ways to fail and being comfortable with it and holding on to it and trying to fail more would probably have led me to where I am now a lot earlier, being comfortable with that failure. I read something three or four weeks ago, and it was, if you considered yourself a failure every time you had to redo something, then a marathon is 26.1 miles of failure and only 0.1 mile of success. It takes those 26.1 miles of failure of every step to get to that final step where you cross the finish line. And so being happy with failures is what actually gets you to the finish line. And if you don't sit in that failure world and enjoy it, then you will never get to the finish line. So yeah, for me, I wish I had learned earlier to fail boldly. 
Well, I love that. And somebody had asked me and I said, for me, it was ego. And it kind of plays off of what you were saying is I didn't go to West Point. And so when I came out, I was overcompensating because when I went to Berlin, I would tell you 80% of our officer corps was West Point. And so I had this inferiority complex and that if I had a failure, oh my God, I wanted to sweep that under the rug, throw a tarp, throw a GP medium on it. I didn't want anybody to see it. And that was all ego-based. So I love that advice. So I'm just going to close out with a simple question. What is next for Lisa? What should we look forward to? Because we talked kind of about the book, but we'll close out with what's next for you? What do you hope to be doing? Yeah, George, so you mentioned the book, which is is complicated and fun. Got to talk to my son last night, actually, after he had a football game. And we talked about the book because he read most of it. And then he really didn't understand who's the audience. Who are you trying to reach out to? And you and I talked about General Milley and trying to use my voice. And I think my path forward is all about how I use that voice. So I've done construction management. I've done project management, program management since 2000. I love it, but I have a voice now, which I didn't have before when I was career planning, when I was looking at my long-term life. And now what I see my benefit to society, the, the mark in the sand that I'm going to leave behind is going to be how can I positively influence others to push themselves How can I get the 30-somethings or the 40-somethings who have gone through their checklist and the only thing that's remaining is die? And (laughs) speaking to a 13-year-old really actually helped me because he's in eighth grade. So he's going to graduate middle school. Then he's going to graduate high school. Then he's going to graduate from college. Then he's going to get his first job, get his first house, get married, have babies, and then die. Like what is there between the, hey, I love my house. I love my life. I love my wife. I love my kids. And I'm retiring. And those are the people I want to reach out to. And so to make a short story long, because that's the only way I know how to do it, (laughs) is the goal of the book. I've done keynote speaking for a while. I want to do more in the get into the weeds within the company, whether that's some sort of advisory role. And you know a little bit more than I'll put out to the wider group. But There's more coming. Yes. With regards to executive and professional coaching, I have my first couple clients doing that right now and just helping people see that it's not get married, have kids, buy a house and die. There's hopefully 40, 50 years in there that we can add to society. And it's not just, hey, I'm going to go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, rinse and repeat. My goal is to try to help more people see how Every day can be a great day and adding value and always pushing for the next goal, even if it's going to a ranger school when you're old enough to be the mother of half of your classmates. <laughs> that's what I feel like sometimes at the talent war group looking around. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, I think that's a great note to close on. I look forward to seeing you accomplish it all, hopefully getting to help in any way that I can. I got to tell you. It's a personal and professional pleasure to work with you, to learn from you, and certainly a gift to have you on today. And I think you're probably going to have to come back at some point. So I hope you have a great week. I hope the power stays on, and I look forward to talking again soon. Same here. Thanks, George. Bye. And thank you for listening to the Talent War podcast, where we discuss all things talent, focusing on a true talent mindset which is a core belief that the only true competitive advantage you can hope to achieve and maintain is your talent. Join us for the next episode of the Talent War podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe, please leave a review and connect with Dr. Tom Lokar and myself on Talent War Group's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram accounts and send your comments and inquiries to media at Talent War Group. The Talent War podcast is brought to you by the Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, seminars, and executive coaching, we will work with you to create talent solutions to your business problems. To get started, please visit us at www.talentwargroup.com.